Tishan, the emperor's brand new governor general for Guangdong province, took 56 days to arrive in Guangzhou from Tianjin. This was four days faster than when Lin had reached his assignment, but still a long time when you consider that the island of Zhou Shan was under foreign occupation. The British fleet reached Macau on November 20th. Qishan arrived in Guangzhou soon after, but did not officially announce himself until November 29th. But his first month there did not resolve much. One Brit had been in custody for some months. He was then released. Lin did not leave the city. He was still there while the British complaints against him were being investigated. But he had been relieved of command. Qishan seems to have agreed to payment to the British of $5 million. It's not clear where those funds would have come from. Perhaps he intended to raise the funds locally. Ending the Chinese tradition of unequal diplomatic communication could be assented to, Qishan suggested. But the granting of Hong Kong to the British was really opposed to all that is reasonable, he replied. And settlement and trade could not be done while Zhou Shan was still occupied, he stressed. The emperor received reports from Qishan and replied from Beijing that the British were not being reasonable. After prolonged negotiation has made them wary and exhausted, we can suddenly attack and thereby subdue them, he wrote to Qishan. So the emperor was no longer willing to soothe. He preferred to exterminate the British. What is interesting considering the final result is how willing Elliot was to compromise. He dropped almost all of Lord Palmerston's demands. Elliot didn't think it was good for long-term relations to push on all topics. He didn't think it was necessary to have five ports opened or to have consular representation or extraterritorial jurisdiction over British and China. He thought that getting permission to trade at one or two other ports was a quiet improvement, much preferred to war. But Elliot's patience was not eternal. On Boxing Day, December 26th, after his troops had eaten roast beef and plum pudding, he threatened to resume hostilities at noon on December 28th if new trading posts had not been agreed to by then. That did not happen, and then on January 7th, 1841, about 10 days after the deadline, Elliot started to move up the Pearl River towards Guangzhou. The river there has many channels. It was considered heavily fortified by the Qing. It has a series of forts on both sides of the approaches. The defenses were the strategy of Guan Tianpei, a Qing admiral. He was commander-in-chief of China's naval forces. In 1834, following the Napier incidents, the emperor had assigned him responsibility for improving the defenses by Guangzhou. He had built up a network of granite forts. He complemented them with rows of chained-together wooden rafts blocking passage. The forts were numerous, but with the same drawbacks. They had no roofs to protect the soldiers, the cannons were antiquated and could not rotate, and his soldiers had poor quality gunpowder. But he had given names to the forts, such as Eternal Peace, Consolidated Security, and Quelling Those from Afar. He also planned to hire locals to approach on small boats and hurl flaming jars of oil at the British ships, or to leap onto warships and win through hand-to-hand -hand combat. Another plan was to row out fire ships, heaped with dry grass and gunpowder, with plans to chain them to British ships and to set them on fire. But these plans were weak because it was unrealistic, given the difference in heights, to expect the Chinese to hurl objects onto a British warship or to be able to climb aboard for hand-to-hand -hand combat. When Lin had been in charge, he had also considered and then rejected hiring practitioners of slow breathing techniques to drill underwater holes in the British ships. He gave up on the idea after realizing they could not hold their breath long enough, but he kept them on the payroll nonetheless so that they wouldn't be tempted by British money. Guan's plans were also weak in that they expected the British to just sail up to the chain of rafts and get fired upon by the forts while stuck in place. The British were not going to fall for that. On January 7th, 1841, they set out methodically to capture the forts one by one and to clear the path to Guangzhou. Before arriving at the first set of forts, they unloaded 1,400 marines, soldiers, and artillery on both sides. The fleet provided covering fire to protect their landing force. They were able to fire their land-based artillery at the first fort on the east bank. Then that landing force scaled the wall by land, and within 25 minutes, the British flag was flying. The remaining Chinese troops at both forts then fled on foot. The next set of forts created a frightful scene. The British used a pincer movement to surround the forts. The defenders fought, but were mowed down by gunfire. Some killed themselves by throwing themselves off the fort's cliff. The commander fought until every part of his skin was perforated with the gunfire that rained down on him. 
there were brain-splattered walls and charred human remains. The Chinese musketeers wore cotton-padded uniforms. They strapped gunpowder to themselves for supply. That was a big risk if their matches fell or if they were exposed to fire for any reason. The British surprised and overwhelmed the defenders by the land-based attacks. But they also had an unexpected advantage at sea. Their best ship was the Nemesis. It was a brand new iron-clad steamer. It required tremendous amounts of coal to get to China, 11 tons a day. But now that it had arrived, its advantages were its iron sides, accuracy of fire, and her shallow draft. That was particularly important in these river campaigns, where she could reach places that the Chinese never expected a sea vessel to be able to reach, since they are usually deeper bottomed. The nemesis could tow ships when there was no wind at all. That was not only a real, but also a psychological weapon. Once the outer forts had been reduced to ruins by the British, the nemesis then annihilated what fighting ships the Chinese had. Those ships had been stained back in shallow waters, where they believed they would be safe. But the nemesis could proceed far closer than expected. Another British ship, the Larne, cut off any path of retreat for the Chinese fleet and therefore pinned them. The nemesis fired a rocket, and it must have been a lucky shot. There was a huge blast. The rocket must have reached some ammunition. The Chinese ship simply exploded with tremendous force. The crews of the other Chinese ships panicked and moved towards shore, where the crews fled by land. The nemesis then destroyed those abandoned ships by lunchtime. After the first day of fighting, the Qing had lost about 280 dead and 460 wounded. The British had destroyed 173 Qing cannons and 11 Chinese warships. The nemesis had received some damage on her paddle box. 38 British soldiers were wounded with no dead. The next day, on January 8th, they proceeded towards the next set of forts and were met by a small boat skiffed by an elderly woman. Her message from Admiral Guan was, let us resume talks. Now, Chinese politics took over. Lin was still in Guangzhou while the complaints against him were investigated. He jumped on the political offensive. He said that the Chinese cited traitors, including Qi Shan at the top. Lin even suggested Qi Shan deliberately wrecked everything. He must have been allied with the British, it was suggested. Lin said that the foreigners had not dared to attack Guangzhou when he was in charge because the defenses were strong. Qi Shan, on the other hand, had sabotaged things. Another official, who later also suffered a defeat to the British in southeast China, impeached Qi Shan to the emperor. He alleged that Qi Shan had disbanded his units and that they had gone over to the enemy and attacked the forts from behind. These accusations seemed completely unsubstantiated. The conspiracy theory and blame on Qi Shan was easier for the Qing elite to stomach than the alternative, that they were badly outgunned by the British. Qi Shan, on the other hand, blamed his own troops. He also blamed their weapons the vulnerability of the forts, and naval crews prone to seasickness. He said about the provincial people in Guangdong that their main characteristics were falsehood, ingratitude, and greed. They're used to mixing daily with the foreigners and regard them like brothers. By January 21, 1841, Qishan had received a draft treaty from Elliot, but also the emperor's response sent in late December rejecting British demands. The demands rejected by the emperor and requested in the treaty had already been watered down by Elliot. He had expressed that he was willing to settle for less than the demands by Lord Palmerston. Nevertheless, the emperor found them totally excessive. It's time to dispatch a punitive mission to suppress them. If they try to hand over any more communications, you are not permitted to receive them. My mind is made up. The emperor wrote that before the forts were captured, but by the time it arrived, much had happened. Qishan did not think it wise to follow the emperor's orders. Guan tried to prop up defenses, and Qi Shan did accept British letters. He even banqueted Elliot face to face for the first time in five months. Qi Shan later denied it to the emperor and said he just happened to bump into Elliot and had offered him some light refreshments. Qi Shan stalled for time and fussed over language in the draft treaty and waited for news that the British had left Zhou Shan while installing new cannons and preparing as best he could for a further battle. On February 13, 1841, Qi Shan received two letters. One was from Elliot asking him to sign the draft treaty. The other was from the emperor, announcing that he would be replaced with the emperor's cousin, Yishan, who was a veteran of the 1830s wars in Xinjiang. On February 24, 1841, the British troops did end their occupation of Zhoshan Island to meet their obligations under the unsigned treaty. 
The next day, on February 25th, the British started attacking again to clear the last line of defense to Guangzhou. The British unloaded troops onto the fortress of Anonghoi, as well as Wong Tong. Many defenders fled, but others died fleeing down hillsides. The nemesis tried to rescue those in the water, but many Chinese chose to hold themselves underwater rather than be saved. At Wong Tong, the officers locked their soldiers inside the fort to prevent them from escaping. But then the officers left by boat. Their own soldiers then fired the cannons towards the escaping officers. At Wu Yong, another fort, the Guangdong soldiers fled first, then followed by the reinforcements from Hunan province. When they bottlenecked at a bridge, some were forced into the water. Those that came behind used the heads of the first one as stepping stones. They drowned the other soldiers as they tried to pass over them. By February 27th, the forts of eternal peace, consolidated security, and of suppressing, overawing, and quelling those from afar had all fallen, along with Admiral Guan. He tried to pay the defenders to stay, but when they started to flee, he drew his sword and then was shot dead by British. The British claimed to have killed 600 Chinese and captured 460 cannons, and they reported having five wounded soldiers of their own. Again, conspiracy and treachery were alleged by the officers, but the truth was probably that their cannons couldn't swivel to do any real damage, and many soldiers ran away. Over the next three weeks, the British forces pushed through rice paddies and rivulets to burn forts and otherwise clear defenses. Often they were supported by locals who accepted to work for pay. By March 13th, Elliot was back at the factories of Guangzhou and believed that the Qing had suffered 2,000 fatalities while the British had four dead. But that was the day the emperor had Qi Shan removed from the city in chains. His property was confiscated and he was being transported to Beijing for trial. There he was interrogated for weeks and condemned to death. But that was commuted to banishment. And by 1842, once the war was over, the emperor reinstated him and he enjoyed numerous senior roles until his death 12 years after that. Lin was exiled to Xinjiang in the northwest of China. It seems like most of the locals were willing to work for whomever paid them reasonably. Locals had been engaged in opium smuggling until that stopped. Then they were paid by the Qing to build defenses. Then they were willing to work for the British again. The Guangdong residents would offer food or water or piloting services, even when it was prohibited by the Qing. Now the emperor was on to his third commander. The emperor appointed his cousin Yishan and Yang Feng to Guangzhou, both as generals. This was in February 1841. General Yang had a good reputation of having quashed rebellions before. He had joined the army at 15 years old, and he had particularly stood out in 1828 when he had captured Jihangir, the Central Asian leader who had declared a jihad against the Qing. Yang sent him in Beijing for execution. He received the honor of becoming the Marquis of Resolute Bravery, third degree. He was, however, now 71 years old and had already been in retirement for six years when he was appointed by the emperor. He was so deaf he communicated with his colleagues in writing. He also had not encountered Europeans before. He arrived in Guangzhou in early March 1841. He immediately noted that the foreigner's cannon always strikes us, but ours cannot strike them back. So far so good with this analysis. But then he continued, why have they been so successful against us? They must be making use of the dark arts. He ordered women's chamber pots collected and they were to be sent out on wooden rafts to defend the city. He also had effigies created. Battling supernatural forces was his plan. Optimism towards him turned to mockery. He was seen buying watches and foreign goods all day long. And ultimately, when the British did advance, he was as scared as everyone else and retreated behind the city walls. On March 18th, with the British flag flying above the factory outside Guangzhou, Elliot made written demands of Yang Feng. Trade needed to resume. Yang answered on March 20th, and trade did resume. The harbor was soon busy with trading business with all nations. While the sides were still officially at war, trade was brisk. Opium was offloaded. Tea was uploaded. By the end of May, the British were purchasing and loading half a million pounds of tea a day there. The emperor's orders to Yang were to destroy the enemy. Apparently he could not. So instead he too lied to the emperor. On March 12th, which was six days before he allowed trade to resume, Yang had written to the emperor, and told an opposite story to what had occurred at Wuyong when the fleeing Guangdong and Hunan soldiers had trampled each other. 
The story he told the emperor was that the British had suffered 416 casualties and said that was far higher than the Chinese casualties. The emperor informed his cabinet that Yang Feng was a military genius. He replied, I wait news of your victory. My happiness is beyond expression. On March 17th, Yang Feng lied again that a British attempt to charge Guangzhou had resulted in a great Qing victory. He said that two of their large warships, a steamer, and a dozen smaller ships had tried to charge up the river. They were met by a hundred cannons firing in unison. He then said the British fled in terror, no longer daring to advance. But that lie caused new problems for Yang. The emperor couldn't understand why he would not follow up on these supposed victories and strike a final blow against the British. The emperor wrote to Yishan, Yang Feng's victory shows that Guangzhou has nothing to fear. You must hurry to find a way to cut off the foreigners' retreat and ruthlessly exterminate them to impress upon them how mighty we are. Yishan, the cousin of the emperor, who was another general, was then arriving. Yishan was Yang Feng's superior. Yishan was the descendant of a previous emperor and had been serving in Xinjiang. It may have been the distance between Xinjiang and Guangzhou that explained why he arrived second. But it was also because before setting off on his new appointment, he spent two weeks gathering a retinue and he set off with quite a fanfare on February 16th. His retinue had 50 people and he was carried while others were on horseback or in carriages. A Russian observer there found that strange. In Russia, he said, if a man receives orders, he just gallops off. That's not how things are done here. Yishan arrived in the province of Guangdong after 46 days travel but then he waited a further 10 days just inside the provincial border. As we know, on March 18th, Elliot and the British had reached Guangzhou and demanded trade, and Yang Feng had capitulated. On March 22nd, Yang tried to spin this in a report to the emperor. He said they had turned up on that day begging for trade. They no longer harbor unruly designs and only want the old system to resume. The emperor did not think such humility was sufficient and thought it a ruse. He insisted that Yang cut off the retreat, and storm Hong Kong. On April 3rd, Yang Feng admitted to the emperor that he had effectively authorized trade. That made the emperor furious, who did not understand. Of course, the emperor had not been informed of the true situation by his representatives. On April 23rd, the emperor announced the dismissal of Yang Feng, but invited him to stay at Guangzhou to try to redeem himself. The emperor ordered 17,000 troops to converge in Guangzhou and had allocated 3 million ounces of silver to finance the recapture of Hong Kong. He certainly wanted the British exterminated. But how to do so? The forts had been taken and the cannons captured. The Qing had no navy capable of beating the British. And the local population seemed more interested in trading than in pushing out the foreigners. Generally, the Qing officials also distrusted and disdained the locals. They considered them unreliable. And in the view of some, the best outcome was to have them and the British kill each other. Use poison against poison. A local evil can be removed. But the locals didn't think any better of Yishan. They said he had no interest in logistics, battle plans, of learning the topography, or strategy. Instead, he preferred buying watches and woolens and giving or attending banquets. As the 17,000 troops arrived, it was clear they were not strong warriors. They were underfed, underpaid, undertrained, and under-equipped. Yang Feng wrote to the emperor and said that they were unaccustomed to naval warfare. He stalled for time, mentioning the troops from Hunan and Guangxi were still expected, as were saltpeter supplies. Yishan did have a battle plan. It was a bold water attack. Assault teams on small ships, fireboats, and rafts loaded with flammable materials would rush at the ships. They would be supported by land-based cannons. There were two main problems with the plan. He did not trust the local population, so he wanted to rely on amphibious commandos from two other coastal provinces. But by the day of the planned attack, he had less than 1,000 of them. So he added 700 extras from other areas like Sichuan, which is inland. Also, the top secret plan was not so secret. The British were easily able to see the troops and supplies arriving and the combustibles being stockpiled. Some people, like Hao Kua, the wealthiest Hong merchant, quickly shared information with the British when they returned to the factory outside Guangzhou. Elliot had enough forewarning to tell the British and American merchants to leave the factories before the counterattack started. That level of detail seems to have come from a local informant. The British Navy was prepared, in the river and all was quiet, until they saw several Chinese ships chained together 
being lit on fire and drifting towards the British. More ships and rafts followed, stuffed with oil-soaked cotton. Chinese troops were moving towards them in the water, too, perhaps planning on drilling holes in the British ships. The British fired artillery, which put off the attackers, and the British lead ship was able to maneuver enough to avoid the fire ships. But the Chinese had also installed cannons among the houses, and the fire from them was dangerous for the British. The air was very calm, which restricted their ability to maneuver. But the nemesis being steam-powered was not dependent on the wind, and it was moving to reply to the Chinese cannons. But one of its lit rockets was stuck in its firing tube. That risked a serious explosion. But the British Captain Hall calmly reached down and dislodged it, at the cost of serious burns to his hand. Before the Chinese fire ships could do damage, the nemesis was on the move and firing. The ebb tide allowed the other British ships to pull back enough. With the nemesis and other British ships unharmed and firing, and British soldiers firing at the Chinese soldiers, the Chinese lost the initiative. Later, the tide turned, and the fire rafts were pulled back towards shore and ended up lighting up the wooden southern suburbs. The British had the full initiative now and landed two miles northwest of the city, further than they had ever been before. They unloaded howitzers and other field guns and rockets to the Mountain of Transcendent Excellence, a local hill near the center of the northern part of the city wall, a few hundred feet up. By 10 a.m. on May 25th, the British controlled that hill and some further forts. The next day, the British had their artillery pointed at Guangzhou from the hill and fortifications. They were finally able to see into the city and countryside that had been forbidden to them. No foreign trader had been allowed in Guangzhou, nor could they trade at any other port anywhere in China. The result in Guangzhou seems to have been a breakdown in order. By nighttime, fires were breaking out throughout the city. Much of that was likely from British bombardment. But the Qing soldiers also looted the foreign factories and then the houses in Guangzhou. Many people, especially civilians, but also some soldiers, fled to the countryside. The potential for civil war was very real. Tensions were particularly high between the Guangdong people and the Hunanese soldiers. It was said that the Hunanese had slept with female lepers and ate the flesh of children. So local soldiers murdered those so-called Hunanese children eaters. In spite of the chaos and before the British could cause further damage on Guangzhou with their artillery, a truce was agreed to. A six million dollar ransom and the non-Guangdong troops would withdraw at least 60 miles within six days. On May 29th, some British went exploring through the countryside. They entered temples and catacombs and opened some tombs. They looked at the embalmed and shriveled bodies before returning to camp. The next morning, 5,000 peasant fighters, armed with spears, shields, and swords, had gathered behind the British camp. The British moved to disperse them, but then a heavy rainstorm began and it interfered with their weapons. Seeing that the rain had stopped the British firearms, the locals attacked. In the main group of English, one soldier was dead and another had suffered some cuts. But one company had been separated and was seen to be surrounded. They suffered another dead and 15 wounded. They were rescued and the locals fled. But the next day, 25,000 locals came out. This time, the British issued a threat that they needed to disperse or else the city would be attacked and every neighboring village burned. The Guangzhou prefect, Yu, went out to the locals to explain that peace had been signed. You must let the foreigners go. On June 1st, 1841, the ransom was paid, and the British, assisted by 800 local laborers, transported their weapons back to the ships. Today, Chinese school children are taught about the San Yuan Li people's anti-British struggle. To today's Chinese Communist Party, this was the first time that rural peasants had self-organized to resist imperialism. It seems like the British desecration of the dead was a major cause. There's also a suggestion that looting and perhaps even rape were additional causes. Whatever happened around those villages caused a much more serious local resistance than what the British had seen before that. Now poems and stories have been written about those incidents, but at that time the locals felt anger towards both the British and Qing officials. It was the prefect Yu who told the villagers to disperse. He was also the one who paid the ransom to the British. He must have sensed the shame of it because he did it in secret and in disguise. But his identity was sufficiently known that three months later, examination students refused to have him officiate their exams. We all know what integrity, righteousness, and honor are. We will not sit exams adjudicated by that traitor, they are reported to have said and to have hurled objects at him. 
But anti-British sentiment was not universal following these events. For example, on July 20th, Charles Elliot and General Bremer were traveling from Macau to Hong Kong. A typhoon struck. Some sailors were thrown overboard by the weather. The mainmast had fallen, and they narrowly avoided rocks. Ultimately, a dozen of them washed up on an island with very basic supplies. Elliot came across some Chinese men and recognized one as a boatsman from Macau. They agreed to a price for transportation to Macau. The British were hidden in a shed until the weather improved. Then the price was tripled. Elliot agreed, and they laid down in a boat covered with mats. The ship was approached by an official Chinese vessel who asked if they'd come across any shipwrecks. The locals answered no, and the official passed. They continued on and were transferred to a Portuguese ship outside of Macau. At no point did the locals turn Elliot and the general over to the Qing officials. Even though the Qing were actually offering a very substantial reward for the capture of Elliot and Bremer, the official reward was higher than the price Elliot paid. It might have been that the Chinese sailors ignored the government's notices, or they might not have felt there was anything right in handing them over to the officials. So now Guangzhou was defenseless and free from the British because of a paid ransom. Did the officials tell the emperor what had happened? No. The lies continued. Yishan's reports of the events of May 21st to 27th were full of boasts. The emperor's cousin claimed that multiple British ships had been sunk and countless rebels killed. The nemesis had been forced into retreat. Yes, he admitted the British had taken some hills because of treachery of some locals, but the British had then waved from the outside of the walls. They removed their hats and made obeisance. They hadn't been allowed to trade and were facing bankruptcy. Could they beg the general to ask the great emperor to take mercy on them, to permit trade, and to make the Hong merchants pay their debts? If so, they would immediately leave the river and not make any more trouble, he added. Cleverly, Yishan disguised the ransom as debts owing to the British by the Hong merchants. It worked. The emperor replied on June 18th, The nature of these foreigners is like that of dogs and sheep. It isn't worth trying to bargain or reason with them. Now they've taken off their hats and bowed, begging for imperial mercy. I forgive you. And the merchants could cover those debts. Yishan received the news on June 30th and replied that the British commanders were overjoyed, removing their hats and prostrating themselves with emotion, crying out that they would never dare make trouble in the province again. That pleased the emperor, and he demobilized the forces he had convened over the last six months. Yishan was awarded the Order of the White Jade Feather, and 554 of his subordinates received promotion or other rewards. The emperor thought it was a good outcome. He could decrease his military expenses, and the British were chastised. The only further pain was debts being paid by those traders, the Hong merchants. What the emperor did not know, because Yishan hid it from him, was that the peace only applied in Guangdong province. Elliot said they would withdraw our troops from Guangdong. This province need not fear further injury. But now Elliot was removed at command by order from London. He was to be replaced. Opposition to Elliot had been building since October 1840, when his cousin Lord Auckland, the Governor General of India, complained of how long this matter was taking. The occupation of Joshan Island was a particular point of contention. It was costly in terms of disease and expense. Initially, Elliot's cousin George Elliot, who was admiral, carried more of the blame. But George Elliot had departed in December 1840, pleading ill health. After that, all recriminations were focused on Charles Elliot, mostly for being too tender with the Chinese and for pulling his punches. On April 20th, Lord Palmerston sent Elliot a two-column document comparing his original instructions with what he had actually achieved. You seem to have considered that my instructions were waste paper. Elliot had not achieved reasonable tariffs for British imports, terms of diplomatic equality, opening of northern ports, or abolishing the monopoly of the Hong merchants and what he had in his treaty had not even been ratified by the Qing. The British traders did not seem satisfied that he had paused hostilities and gotten the usual trade seasons opened. Elliot, however, reasoned that the trading over two years was worth more than £10 million and had generated £8 million of custom duties against a half million pounds in expenditures on the expeditions. Elliot considered that financial compensation, reopening of trade, and gain of Hong Kong be a good outcome. It would not be overly harsh on the Chinese, he also predicted that Hong Kong, with its exceptional harbor and usefully close but safely distant location from the mainland, would become one of the most important and perhaps the most interesting possession of the British crown. By the early summer of 1841, Elliot was recalled and Henry Pottinger replaced him.
the time for more gunboats and less diplomacy had arrived. The British wanted more war.